We look today at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 18 through 27, and the title of my sermon is, The Danger of Following Jesus. The Danger of Following Jesus. We aren't identical twins, but sometimes my brother and I act like it. How many of you knew that I had a twin brother? How many of you met him? Great, great. Well, when we were around 11 years old, as I recall, my dad took us out in a little boat fishing uh, somewhere near Gabriola Pass. And if you know the pass, you know the waters can get choppy there. And the hull of the boat made this banging sound every time it came over the wave and came down on the other side. And I was thrilled. It was so much fun, I felt like a sailor. But I could see the fear on my brother's face, especially as the boat banged and he was staring at the white caps on the waves. There were white caps on the waves. And so it was hard for me to enjoy the ride when I could just, I could, I could feel how frightened he was. Last Sunday, we were looking at Matthew chapter 8, just this first 17 verses, verse 1 through 17, that is, at at how those miracles that Jesus performed, the way Matthew has written them, they call you to come and know the Savior God has sent. But here in these verses here, it seems more like Jesus is trying trying to discourage people from following him. There's a tone of warning to these verses. The scene opens up on the beach or, or near the beach of that large lake called the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus had been healing people all evening. We see that in verse 16. And then now it must be dark. It's late. The sky was overcast. Maybe there were storm clouds already gathering, although storms can come up very quickly in that region. If Matthew was painting this scene instead of writing it, you know, he would not be using pastel colors and bright, cheerful tones in his painting. That's not what following Jesus is going to be like. I think Matthew would have used If he was painting this instead of writing it, he would have used somber, maybe ominous, darker shades and colors if he was painting this scene. But notice how the scene is framed, will will you? Look at the text, the scripture here, and notice how it's framed. Look what verse 18 and then verse 28 tell us. This is the frame of this particular painting. In verse 18, Jesus tells them to get a boat ready to cross the lake. That's what his words amount to. In verse 28, they reach the other side of the lake. So there's the frame. This passage, what happens in this passage, happens in between those two events. By the lake and on the lake, with clouds overhead, and it's dark. But finally, Jesus can get some rest. This has been a long day for him. He healed in chapter 4. He preached in chapters 5 through 7. And now he's healed again that evening and he's tired. He can get some rest. He can get away from the crowds. Would you look with me at the end of chapter 4? The end of chapter 4, verse 25 These crowds have been following Jesus for a long time. In chapter 4, verse 25, you'll notice it says, when when he saw the, seeing the crowds, when he sees the crowds, he goes up the mountain. He goes up the mountain in chapter 5, verse 1, and he begins to preach to them. But they followed him up the mountain, and then in chapter 8, verse 1, if you just skip ahead a few chapters, Again, Jesus comes down the mountain, and who follows? The crowds follow him again. 
And then we get to chapter 8, verse 18, the text we're beginning to look at this morning. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. These these crowds, these were people who lived in the region, people who had gathered to the region. They were familiar with what was on the other side of the lake. They knew what was across the water, and they did not want to go there. Over on the other side of the lake is, is Gentile territory. It's not where good Jewish people are going to go if they don't have to. They don't want to go there. They don't want to follow Jesus there. But that's where Jesus is going, and maybe it's intentional that he doesn't want this crowd to keep following him anymore. They wouldn't be able to follow there. But Matthew, Matthew wants his readers to notice who does want to follow Jesus there. So this scene by the lake and in the boat, it's the setting for three answers that Jesus gave to three different cases where, where men wanted to follow Jesus, but didn't understand what that would mean. If you've de- decorated your Christmas tree, it's like how you hang garland on the branches of the, of the tree. Matthew's story here is hung on three statements, three sayings Jesus gives, three things, his answers that he gives to three different kinds of would-be followers. And they, they are warnings. They, they really are warnings. And Matthew wrote these things down in such a way that they become warnings to his readers, warnings to you and me. They apply to us. What I want you to see in this passage then this morning is that Jesus gives three answers, alerting would-be followers of the danger ahead. But not so that you would decide not to follow Jesus. That's not his purpose. It's so that you would know what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus' first warning then comes in verses 18 to 20. And what, what it says to you is this. This is my first point. Heed the danger of following where Jesus leads. Heed the danger of following where Jesus leads. So look with me at verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. He's still near the lake or on the way to the beach, and the crowd's still following him, and the crowd's around him, and Jesus is saying, we're going over there. Get the boat ready. So I imagine at this point, some of the disciples, quite possibly the ones who were experienced fishermen we read about earlier, In chapter 4, maybe they're the ones, they go get a boat ready. Jesus sees a crowd and he's heading to the other side. But then we see in verse 19, something happens right there. A scribe comes up and says says to Jesus, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Nobody else wanted to follow. But the scribe says, Lord, well, he says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, perfect. I've been waiting for a recruit like you. I'll bet that's what the scribe thought Jesus would say. The scribe is one of the most highly educated men in Israel. Scribes were. And notice what he calls Jesus. Teacher. Teacher. That was a good sermon, teacher. I'm ready to follow you wherever, wherever you need to go. You need someone like me. I can help you with your teaching. I'm a scribe. He says he has commitment that the crowd doesn't have. He's willing to go places the crowds wouldn't go. He's, willing to, he's able, he's equipped to do things for Jesus. Jesus must need. I'll bet he thought he was... Offering Jesus a really good deal. And then we see in verse 20, Jesus doesn't see it that way. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. And the scribe would get this point. But the son of man 
has nowhere to lay his head. Well, a scribe would know the Bible. That's what scribes do. And he knew Jesus was referring to Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man prophecy. And it's so ironic because if you think about it, foxes, they've got those nice little dens. It's cozy in there. It's safe. It's somewhere to sleep and rest and raise their young. And birds are nice and safe in their little nests they make up in the branches of the trees, away from the predators. It's cozy, perhaps. I don't know. But the Son of Man, the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 is prophesied to be presented one day before God, before the Father, the Ancient of Days. And to Him is given dominion and glory and power and a kingdom over the whole planet, All the kings of the earth are his inheritance. They are all given to him. He will rule the world. The earth belongs to him by right. And Jesus says, the son of man, me, right now, I have nowhere. It's so ironic. The world belongs to him, but he's saying to the scribe, you think you're ready to follow me anywhere? You have no idea where we're going. We don't know where we're staying tonight. I'm going to sleep in a boat. You don't know where we're going to go on the other side. You don't know what's involved in following me. Are you ready to give up your financial security? Are you ready to go places you don't want to go? Are you ready to never see home again? I think... When I read this, I have so many friends I've had over the years, especially in my 40s and now in my 50s, friends around the same age who are just getting comfortable in life, who've been working hard for a while and they've saved up some money and they've been making plans. And the one thing that people my age, and I struggle with this as well, seem to have difficulty giving up is comfort. We'd make a great scribe, people like me and Dave. We'd make great scribes. But Jesus would say, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. If you follow me, you might have nothing. Are you ready to pay that cost? Are you willing to give up everything to follow Jesus? So Jesus warns would-be followers of three dangers ahead. And the first danger you need to heed is that where Jesus leads is not easy to follow. If you do want to follow Jesus, you need to know that you're going to be going somewhere where the crowds don't want to go. Most people will have no idea why you would want to follow Jesus because of what's involved. It's going to be hard. You are going to lose relationships. You might lose some of your closest friends you love. Because they won't go with you when you follow Jesus. There will be comforts you will have to give up. There will be opportunities you will forsake. It will cost you far more than you ever thought if you choose to follow Jesus. Are you ready to follow him no matter what it costs? Well, the second danger Jesus alerts would be followers about, it comes in. Verse 21 and verse 22. You need to heed the danger of not following Jesus now. Verse 21 says this. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. This is someone from the crowd. Another person from the crowd. This time it's just an anonymous person from the crowd. One of the many disciples. One of the many followers of Jesus. This isn't yet talking about the 12 that Matthew later refers to. So far, we only know of the fishermen that are following Jesus as his committed disciples, the ones he called. But the whole crowd, in a sense, some of them who are listening particularly and saying, no, he's my teacher, he's my rabbi, I'm his disciple. Some of them are following him like that, like this man. Maybe this disciple had heard what Jesus had just said to the scribe. You don't know where I'm going. You have no idea how hard it would be. And this good, 
I think of him as a young man from the things he says. This good young man says, Jesus, I want to follow you even to the hard places. I'm willing, Jesus. Can I have some time, though? There are some things I need to take care of. Dear old dad, I need to take care of dear old dad. He says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. There might be a hint here of Joseph's request to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 50, verse 5, where Joseph, Jacob had just died and Joseph was grieving and he goes to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and says, he asks for permission. It's almost exactly the same wording. He asks for permission to go and bury his father and Pharaoh says, go. This was a responsibility in ancient cultures, especially Jewish culture. It was a responsibility that rested on the eldest son. The eldest son would be responsible to make sure that burial arrangements were taken care of. If, if your father died, it was on you to make sure everything was handled. It was a, a, a part of a responsibility that goes right along with honor your father and your mother. So this young man, perhaps as I picture him, he's a dutiful son. He's a responsible man. He takes his family commitments seriously, right? Honor your father and mother. That's probably a Bible verse he memorized and had close to his heart. Except the rumors of his dad's death are greatly exaggerated, to paraphrase Mark Twain. Such a responsible son, would he, if his dad had recently died, his body was lying somewhere, would this son who's such a responsible son, would he be out following the crowds around and watching the miracles Jesus is performing? No, he wouldn't be. He'd be at home doing his duty, getting his dad's body ready for burial. Scholars now think that the, this son is not asking for Jesus, just give me a day so I can go and bury my dad. He's asking for months, maybe years. He's saying, I don't know when my father's going to die, so I need an indefinite amount of time, and one day I'll catch up with you. One day I'll follow you when it's better timing for me in my life and my other responsibilities that I have in life are taken care of. Then I'll follow you anywhere like that scribe wouldn't. So Jesus, in verse 22, commands him. Jesus said to him, follow me. It's a command. The implication is, follow me now. Not later. Not next week. Not next month. Not next year. Follow me now. And then Jesus gives a warning. And it's a warning by contrast. He says, and let the dead bury their own dead. Does that sound harsh? Jesus warns him that those who don't follow him now are as good as dead. It reminds me of what Moses said near the end of his sermon in Deuteronomy 30. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. Imagine a preacher preaching like this. That's good preaching. Moses' sermon. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them. Choose life now. Jesus says, follow me now. And I think of kids who grew up in Christian homes like Dave was talking about, like I did as well. No matter how young you are, whether you're 7 or 8 or 10 or 12. I think about the decision that you have to make to follow Jesus. 
Don't wait till you're a teenager. Don't wait till you're 20 years old. Don't wait till you're 30 years old when you're a grown-up. Follow Jesus now. I'm talking to a row of little kids in one, two, three, four, in the fourth row back from the front. Follow Jesus today, not later. Today. So Jesus warns would-be followers that, that following him is going to be hard, but he also warns this responsible son that if you're not following Jesus now, you're choosing the dead over the living. It's hyperbole, Jesus is saying. He's, he's not encouraging you to leave your loved ones unburied. This is not the application of Jesus' sermon. He's not forbidding family responsibility or, or outlawing funerals. He is warning this man about the spiritual condition of everyone who doesn't put Jesus first. Now. You remember chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God and, and his righteousness. Seek first as a matter of top priority. And then we see in Mark chapter 10, verse 28, Peter says, much the same thing to Jesus. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you, Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So heed Jesus' warning. Follow him now, not, not next year. Not five years from now. Put the Lord first. You know what? The Lord will not let you put him second. He isn't that kind of God. Well, then the third danger Jesus alerts would-be followers about happened in the boat. You must heed the danger of not knowing who Jesus is. Look with me at verse 23. Jesus, it says, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. When he got into the, this is the sequence of events, Matthew's moving us along. This is now the climax of his account of this story that Matthew's giving us. He gets into the boat. So if we look at Luke and Mark's account of this, I think what, what we should picture here is that the disciples have actually already gotten the boat ready. Some of the disciples are in the boat and Jesus walks down into the water and he hauls himself over the gunwale into the boat with the other disciples, and they push off. It's dark. They can't see where they're going, but the disciples, they know this lake. They've been fishing it their whole lives. So they push off into the, into the night. Around 1986, there was a boat found on the northwest shore, somewhere close to where the city was of Capernaum, on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it was buried under... under like centuries of mud. It dates back to around this time, a first century boat. And it's, it's a pretty big boat. It, it's, it's well preserved now in a museum at Genosar. At, I can't pronounce the name of the museum. But it, it's preserved there and it's big enough to fit about 12, 13 people, 13 men. Not big, not more. About 12 or 13 men, so maybe it's a good thing. I don't know if the other, if the, the scribe and the other disciple, if they took Jesus' warnings and turned back, but maybe that's a good thing. There might not have been room for them. But we look at verse 24 and we see what happens here that creates the problem that only Jesus can solve. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. The boat's being swamped. The, the waves are coming over the edges. The boat is filling up. The seasoned fishermen, the experts on that lake, they're terrified. 
and Jesus is sleeping, there's a complication. Jesus is sleeping. Oh, the humanity of Jesus. Omnipotent God and tired, weak, exhausted human. There's the miracle. Philippians 2 says, He humbled himself by becoming one of us, taking the form of a servant, like us in every way in the flesh. And this servant was so tired, he slept through a storm. And Matthew's readers here, when Matthew's readers read the, the book that Matthew wrote to tell this, just like the scribe would have, they would realize a parallel here with the book of Jonah. God told Jonah to preach in, in Nineveh. What did Jonah do? He ran away to Spain. He was on his way to Spain. It's the opposite direction. And Jonah headed the wrong way in disobedience. He ran from God. And he caught a ship. And that ship was en route. And a storm came up. And a storm was washing, the, it was wrecking the ship. And the sailors, again, experienced sailors, they're terrified they're going to die. And the captain finds Jonah to wake him up, or finds Jonah so that he'll pray to his God. And Jonah's sleeping. It's exhausting work running from God. Jonah's tired. He's sleeping. And the captain wakes him up and says, pray to your God. And then pretty quickly they put a couple things together and Jonah admits that he, well, actually, he's running from God. And the sailors are shocked and terrified by that idea that this prophet is running from God. And so they say, what do we need to do? And Jonah says, you need to throw me overboard. Then God's wrath will be turned away. And so they do. They throw him overboard. And you know what it says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 14? The sailors prayed to the Lord. Lord, save us from perishing. The disciples woke up Jesus. And they said, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Here we have the request of the disciples... But then we read just a little bit later that they're absolutely stunned by what Jesus did to save them. So what did they expect would happen? Maybe the disciples were thinking that he'd rescue them, something like Jonah did by praying to his God. Maybe they thought Jesus would pray to God and save them that way. Maybe they thought Jesus would, would do what Moses did and pick up his staff and stretch out his hand over the Red Sea and, and the seas would part. Maybe they thought Jesus would take his cloak like Elijah did and strike the water with his cloak and, and the, the Jordan River would dry up so they could cross over. What they didn't expect was what he did. They never saw that coming. But Matthew's readers are also surprised because at no point previous to this in the Gospel of Matthew has Jesus ever demonstrated power and authority over the natural world? Diseases, sickness, demons, yes. Not over nature. They're unprepared for what Jesus was about to do, but what Matthew shows us here points out that they wouldn't have been afraid or they shouldn't have been afraid if they knew who he is. Which is why in verse 26, Jesus rebukes them. Matthew puts this first. Jesus responds to the disciples before he speaks to the wind and the waves. Matthew wants us to notice this first. He said to them, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? If you were in a boat crossing the Atlantic and you had the world's most experienced captain with the world's most experienced crew... And they are all absolutely terrified. Would you be afraid? Yes. You would be foolish not to be afraid. 
The experts are afraid. That's when you get scared. Seasoned fishermen that know this lake well, and they all think they're going to perish in verse 25. Fear would be rational. So why does Jesus say, why? Why are you afraid? Look at verse 26. The answer is right there. Oh, you of little faith. That's the problem. Before saving them from drowning, Jesus rebukes them for being afraid, for having little faith. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, because we've seen this before. When Jesus was preaching in his sermon, he pointed out the flowers that, they're, that are beautiful and dressed like Solomon wasn't ever dressed. And Jesus says in, in verse 30 of chapter 6, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? When you're worried about what you're going to wear, not like to look good, but to be safe, to be protected from the cold. When you're worried about how you're going to afford clothes, Jesus is saying, don't you know who God is? If you are his child, if you, if you follow him, if you know the Lord, if you are a Christian, don't you know who God is? Don't worry. But here he's saying something a little bit different, isn't he? He's not saying, don't you know who God is? He's saying, don't you know who I am? Oh, you of little faith. And in verse 26, we see this crisis comes to a resolution. The problem is solved. He rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The word rebuke there is so interesting to me. There are synonyms for this word. Words that mean similar things to this word here, rebuke, are warn, reprove, admonish, denounce, disapprove. Jesus speaks to the wind and to the seas in a disapproving way, in a warning way, in a chastising way. Psalm 106 verse 9 says, Yahweh rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up so that Israel could walk through it. Isaiah 50 verse 2, Yahweh himself says, by my rebuke I dry up the sea. Nahum chapter 1 verse 4 says, God rebukes the sea. What is Matthew saying here? Do you realize the greatest danger you could ever be in is not to be in a little boat in a big storm. It's to not know who Jesus is. And this makes me think of the terrible tragedy when so many people today call themselves Christians but seem to have no idea who Jesus really is. If they knew the world would see a difference if they knew who Jesus is. So many people in the world say they're Christians, that they even follow Jesus, but by their lives, do you get a sense that they've encountered this man, this person, the Lord we see here? Would we be so casual? Would you be so casual? about your claim to follow Jesus if you had seen him do this. Look with me at verse 26 towards the end of the verse. There was a great calm. How can that be? The laws of physics. If you go have a bath this evening when you get home and, and you fill up the bath higher than you should, and you rock back and forth in that bath until the waves are really going. Try this. I've done it. And then you say, peace, be still. You know what happens? Nothing. 
The waves keep going back and forth. I've tried it. I actually have tried it. Because I heard another preacher say the same thing, so I went home and tried it. The laws of physics, it takes time for a lake that size to calm down from a big storm, doesn't it? How can it be a great calm like that? You know, an, an ancient Greek philosopher named Epicurus and other philosophers like him in similar schools of philosophy at the time, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, they had the idea that really all there is in the world is cause and effect. Stuff. You bang something into something else and it does something. Cause and effect. Materialism. But then something happened. And something happened that changed the way at least the Western world and now much of the world thinks about the world we live in. There was a man born in a little place called Bethlehem. God came into the world. And the scriptures of the Old Testament and the scriptures of the New Testament foretell and proclaim this event. God came into the world. It's not just stuff. It's not just materialism. Cause and effect. And this God who came into the world is the same God that we see in Genesis 1 spoke. He said, let there be light. And do you know what there was? Light. It existed. The God that was in that boat with those disciples, those frightened fishermen, is the same who created the heavens and the earth. There was great calm because Jesus decided there would be great calm. A miracle isn't when God interferes with the laws of nature. A miracle is when God does something differently than he normally does. That's all a miracle is. God all the time upholds the whole universe by his will, by the word of his power. So when Jesus decides to calm the storm, all he needs to do is speak to it, changes his mind, and it flattens. People misunderstand miracles today. So many people today, and maybe you, you really don't agree with science. You agree with pagans long time before Jesus. Science is just now trying to get God out the door by saying, we're retreating to cause and effect, to just stuff. How can you prove there's just stuff in the universe? The idea that God doesn't interfere in nature is an old, old, old idea. Christianity was the new idea that revolutionized the Western world. Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17 says, In Christ, all things hold together. John 1 verse 3 and Colossians 1 verse 16 say, everything that exists was created through Christ. So when the lake was calm and the winds were gone, and the storm stopped washing over that little boat, it was because Jesus willed it be so. And it was. But the disciples ask a question. In verse 27, the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? And that question needs an answer. The men marveled. They marveled. In verse 10, Jesus marveled that he'd found nobody in Israel with faith like that centurion. In chapter 9, verse 33, after Jesus casts out a demon who made a man unable to speak. The crowds marvel that nothing like that had ever been done in Israel. In chapter 5, verse 31, after seeing all the miracles that Jesus did, the crowds marvel that God had never done such things in Israel before. And here the disciples marvel that no one on earth can make winds and sea obey his voice. Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves like a father speaks to disobedient children and says, stop it. This question needs an answer. They say, who then is, what sort of man is this? I like that. What kind of man can this be? 
At Christmas time, we like to sing and talk about Emmanuel, right? God with us. Taking the name from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 23, it means God with us. The disciples really had no idea who was with them in the boat. They really didn't know who they were following at all. That's the most dangerous thing for someone who professes a Christ, to be a Christian. To say you're following Christ, but not knowing who he is, not really knowing what you believe. What makes you a Christian if you just think you're following religious rules from the Bible about a man named Jesus? In Jonah chapter 1 verse 6, those sailors, they woke Jonah up and asked him to pray to his God. And when they found out that he was a prophet of Yahweh, they were terrified. And they prayed to Yahweh and they threw Jonah into the sea. And you know what happened? The sea ceased its raging. It ceased its raging. Matthew 12 verse 41 says, something greater than Jonah is here. If the scribe who came to Jesus and said he'd follow Jesus anywhere, if he turns back when the following gets hard, is he really a follower of Jesus? If the disciple who wants to follow Jesus later, after he takes care of some things, when it's a better time for him, when his life is more ready for that sort of commitment, is he really following? If you've thrown your lot in with Jesus, even if you go to hard places and you serve him, and you want to be a servant of him. But you're wrong about who he really is. You're not following the real Jesus. The biggest danger facing those disciples was never the storm. It was their lack of faith. If you believe in Jesus, if you trust him, and you know who he really is, well, trust without knowing who he really is is just wishful thinking. But if you know who he really is, and that's the one you believe in, that's the person you rely on, that's the Lord your confidence is in. Even if you die in the storm, you will live forever. But even if you survive the storm for another day, and you don't worship Jesus as God, you will perish in your sins, and you will perish forever. So in that little boat that day with my dad and my brother, my dad saw that Jay was really frightened. And he turned the boat around, and he took us back to shore. When those men in that boat on the Sea of Galilee, when they thought they were perishing in that storm. The Son of God heard their cries. And he asked them a question. Why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith, he said. What Matthew's written here is meant to alert you of the dangers of imagining that you can be a follower of Jesus, that you can be a Christian without putting your life in his hands. He already holds the universe in his, in his hand. You can trust him in life, and you can trust him in death. But you know what he commands you? The same thing he commanded to that other disciple. He says, follow me. Let's pray. Lord, would you give us faith to follow you? Just as Dave said earlier, we often feel like we are split personalities with a desire to do right and follow you and another desire that competes against that and fights against that. Lord, would you give us faith to follow you? 
Let us never look inward in ourselves and say, do I believe the right way or do I believe enough? But let us instead look to see who it is we follow, to look upon Jesus, to see who the scriptures reveal him to be, and to know that if I believe in him, if I trust him, if I'm relying right now, not just once upon a time, but today, if I'm right now relying upon him, aware of my sin and aware that my only hope in heaven is that he died in my place, that I'm relying on him, aware that I cannot, I am not strong enough, I am not big enough, I am not sufficient for the challenges in my life, I am weak, I am frail, I am needy, but my Savior is the Son of God. I'm relying on Him. And like Dave said, even if I'm not relying on Him much or very well, I'm relying on Him and He is sufficient for these things. Lord, give us faith to follow Jesus when it's hard, to follow Jesus immediately and with urgency above everything else, but to follow Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.